Hello, my friends. Welcome to Origins. Thank you for joining me. My name is Don Chapman. It's my privilege to be your host. You know, Origins is a forum where we take the evidence of science and we use it to validate the truth of creation. Today we have a great guest with us. I'm really excited that Dr. Robert Carter can be with us. Dr. Carter, it's so good to have you here. Thank you. Now, you are a graduate of the University of Miami with a Ph.D. in marine biology. Is that right? That's true. And uh, you've spent a lot of time underwater studying. Mm -hmm. uh, but you're above water now. And we're going to talk about creation genetics. Would you explain to me wh exactly what genetics is and uh, what it has to do with creation? Well, genetics is the study of DNA. Okay. And as a geneticist, I like to study DNA, and I like to try to compare what we're learning in the world about what's inside of us with what the Bible tells us should be about, true about human history. Now, when we were having breakfast this morning, you made a fascinating comment. You said for the first time in the whole creation evolution debate, we have things are upside down, that the pile of knowledge is way ahead of the philosophy. Is that right? It's actually one of the few times in world history where we've had more data than we have theory. That's amazing. So people like Darwin, they had lots of theory, and he assembled data to back up his theory, but now we're upside down, and it's really bewildering for, for all the geneticists in the world because we're swimming in numbers and just trying to keep up with what's coming down the pipe. It's a, it's a whole new day in this debate, isn't it? Yes. And, and, and talk to me about how uh, genetics enters that debate. What is the human genome, and how does that fit into all of this? Here's a, a picture of actually someone's genome. Okay. Literally, it's a photograph, because at one stage in the cell division cycle, the chromosomes condense and line up. And you can take a picture under a microscope and cut out the little chromosomes and line them up just like you're on the screen. Wow. This is a set of books. There are three billion letters in those books. But just like an encyclopedia, it's broken down into volumes. We have 46 volumes in our genome. And the volumes are broken down into chapters. We might call those genes. We've got about 20,000 protein coding genes in our genetic encyclopedia. With the exception of the red blood cells, which don't have a nucleus, you've got about six feet of strings packed down into a microscopic nucleus inside every cell of your body. That's amazing. All right, now, um, all of this knowledge is coming. And we have this old book called the Bible. Yes. And it's a book that we as believers believe is absolute truth that doesn't change and isn't going to contradict other truth. So what we're looking at is how does all of this knowledge you're gaining about genetics square up with the knowledge we have from God's Word? Well, it's funny because the Bible claims to be the history book of the universe. Many Christians don't necessarily believe those opening couple of chapters, but it certainly does claim to be. It makes some really comprehensive statements about what God has told man about the history of the universe. Like, the earth is 6,000 years old, he created everything in the universe in six days, and things like that. However, if the Bible really is true, there should be some things that shine out as far as uh, the history of the world, and we could be able to test those with genetics. That's fascinating. Why don't you go up to the board, talk to us about uh, this whole matter of uh, the history of man. What I've got on the board here is two stylized diagrams of history. Okay. I am going to compare here the evolutionary timeline and the biblical timeline. And I do this for the sake of the audience because it's good for us to have a, an, an appreciation for generally what we're talking about. So the top one is the evolutionary out of Africa idea. It's the most common thing we hear in, in media outlets like National Geographic or any newspaper. They talk about out of Africa. And in the out of Africa scenario, what we have is we have approximately one million individuals living in Africa for about a million years. And then something happens. For unknown reasons, the human population crashes. And we are reduced down to this point where there's approximately 1,000 to 10,000 individuals alive, or an effective population size of 1,000 to 10,000 individuals. And then the population rebounds. Modern man evolves in their model here. The population rebounds, we increase the number, and then we leave Africa and we spread out across the world. I guess the obvious question is, the first one is, is there, is there fossil evidence for that million years of Homo erectus in Africa? Um, actually, no. And if, if the average lifespan of a person back then was, say, 20 years, that over that million years, there should have been about 50 billion people that lived and died. And how many bones do we have? A scattering. Yeah. 
there's not evidence for, for those bodies. So there is no fossil record, basically. No, there's no fossil record to, to back up this yes. number of people that should have right. lived there in this time. Right. Well, let's compare that with a biblical model. Okay. The Bible says that God created the earth approximately 6,000 years ago with Adam and Eve. And then they started having children. Their children had children. Their children had children. So the population increased to some unknown number. We don't know how many. Over approximately 1,500 years to round off. And then the population crashes during an event called Noah's Flood, where Noah, his wife, his three sons, and their three wives went on board Noah's Ark. Everyone else in the world died. So the population now is reduced to eight people about 4,500 years ago. And then from those people, they came off the Ark. Their population started increasing again. And then this thing called the Tower of Babel happened, where God spread the people out across the entire world just like this here in, in this region here so it's interesting to see the parallel I mean there's there's evidence that uh, makes the arrows go the same direction it's just a total different philosophy between how you get there be, the, the, you the get parallels there. are uncanny yes I'll get into a second why the evolutionist believes that okay so in in Genesis there are three major events and that is the creation account God creating two people the second one is the flood, where the whole world population is reduced to eight people, and then the Tower of Babel, where we spread out across the world. Just looking at the creation account, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, it says, And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Now, most people are familiar with that. Right. It's a, people read the creation story as a kid's story from the time they're very little. And a little bit later, in Genesis 2, 21 and 22, it says, and the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. It's not a kid's story. This is actually two very profound statements about genetics. Because the Bible very clearly says we started with one man, and God used that man and manufactured a woman. And we can make some predictions based on this. So the first question I like to ask people, and I don't like to usually hear the answer because sometimes they say the wrong answer, is do men have one less rib than woman? Or if the Bible is true, would we expect men to have one less rib than woman? No. No, the answer is no. Because, I mean, if I lose my finger to an ax accident, my children are still going to come out with, with ten fingers. I mean, little girls aren't born with pierced ears. That's right. This is, that's an idea called Lamarckian inheritance, or the, the, the inheritance of acquired characteristics, which was disproven a very long time ago. Sure. So, no, we would not expect men to have one less rib. But a more modern question, one I would like to ask people is, was Eve a clone of Adam? I mean, God took a hunk of Adam's flesh, right. including bone, blood vessels, cells, and DNA, and you manufactured a woman out of it. Well, no, of course, she couldn't be a clone. She's a girl, right? But what's the difference between boys and girls in their genetics? Earlier I said that the human genome is like an encyclopedia and it comes in 46 volumes. But there are two in this picture that are unpaired, the X and the Y chromosome. The person from whom this photograph was taken is a male, and I know that because he carries a Y chromosome. If you have two X chromosomes, you're a girl, you're a female. An X chromosome and a Y chromosome makes you a man. Well, that Y chromosome is not a degenerate leftover from evolutionary history. It's actually a master switch that influences genetic expression of thousands of other genes on all of the other chromosomes and has a profound effect upon us. It makes men, men. Okay. Let's zoom up on just one chromosome. Here's chromosome number two. So here's Adam's DNA. He has two chromosomes. I'm going to say a red one and a yellow one. If Eve is a clone, she inherited the same two chromosomes. So if these chromosomes are a book, and we're reading through two copies of a book, and we're comparing them word for word, and so it turned out, okay, the Bible, okay, Genesis, creation. Oh, wait, I just ran into a word that's spelled different in two books. In the red one, it might, it might be the word color, spelled C-O-L-O-R. In the yellow one, the word color might be spelled C-O-L-O-U-R. There are differences. Now, an evolutionist would say, oh, one of these has a mutation. I would say, no, this has created diversity. All, all differences aren't necessarily bad. They're not necessarily mutation. So we're reading through the genome, A, T, T, C, G, C, A, A, because there's only four letters, A, T, G, and C, A, T, T, C. Oh, here's a T, there's an A. So at most, if he's a clone, there are only two variables at any point in the genome 
such as brown eyes and blue eyes, or type A, ble a blood and type B blood. But blue eyes are actually a mutation. Sorry, you have blue eyes. Um, and A, B blood, we know there's another version of the blood. It's type O blood. So can we actually fit all people into two? Well, there's another biblical possibility. The biblical possibility is that Eve has a completely unique genome. In that case, there are four chromosomes at the beginning of the world. And if we're reading through here, we can find a place where this one has an A, that one has a T, this one might have a G, that one might have a C. But it still puts a limit on the amount of genetic diversity. Because the evolutionary model has thousands of people. We have two. There's a huge difference in there. In thousands of people, you can harbor a lot of genetic diversity. In two people, you cannot harbor many, or much at all. Right. Well, does that fit the evidence? My answer is absolutely. It abundantly fits the current evidence that we find in the world. First of all, evolutionary geneticists, and I've looked at the data, I agree with it. They have found a surprising lack of diversity amongst people across the whole world. This is the reason why they had that population crash in the out of Africa model. They look around and say, man, people are very similar. We must have come from a very small ancestral population. So they've got humanity nearly going extinct. I mean, 1,000 to 10,000 people? Well, that's what the Bible would predict. Okay. Very interesting. Okay. Issue number two is the flood. Well, the Bible says this in Genesis 7, 7. So Noah, with his sons, his wife, and his sons' wives, went into the ark because of the waters of the flood. Okay. In Genesis chapter 9, they come off the ark a year later. And it says, Now the sons of Noah who went out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these the whole earth was populated. Again, these are profound statements about genetics. Because we have three men and their wives, the Bible says, are the ancestors to everyone on earth. Can we actually do that is a great question. Can we explain that? Well, in order to get at that, I need to show this picture one more time and introduce one more piece of DNA. Okay. Now, the genome, all three billion letters in these 46 molecules, is inside the nucleus, which is inside the cell. But there's another piece of DNA that we all have. It's the mitochondrial DNA. What's a mitochondrion? It's a thing that's outside the nucleus. It converts sugar into energy. They, they call them the powerhouse of the cell. Anyone who's had high school biology probably remembers the, the mitochondrion is the powerhouse of the cell. Well, those little mitochondrion, they have a piece of DNA. It's only 16,000 letters long compared to 3 billion over here. It's tiny. I work with mitochondrial DNA. And it's in a little loop. And it carries a few genes on it. And according to theory, and according to a lot of experimental evidence, you only inherit them from your mother. So the mitochondrial DNA and the Y chromosome give us two of the primary tools of modern genetics. Because from these two pieces of DNA, we can do a lot of fun stuff. You can build a family tree of all the men in the world just based on the Y chromosome. And it points back to a single man living in the recent past. Huh. You, can point, you can take all the mitochondrial DNA in the world and build a family tree of all the people in the world based on the female lines. And it goes back to a single female. Now, the evolutionist says, oh, that was 200,000 years ago. But that all depends upon the mutation rate. In one of my future talks, I'm going to talk about mutation rate and how high the mutation rate is. And if we take real live mutation rates, it doesn't take very long at all to explain the entire diversity of all people in the world and the fact that we came from people only a few thousand years ago. So based on that, we can make some predictions also. Based on the flood account, how many Y chromosomes would he expect in the world today? Most people say three or four, but really the answer is one. Really? Because Noah would have given the same Y chromosome to all three of his sons. Right. So there's only one representative on board the ark. Now, each of the sons probably had a couple of mutations in their Y chromosome, but we don't know how many. So essentially, one. How many mitochondrial DNAs would we expect? How many female lines were on board the ark? Well, there's four. But Mrs. Noah is probably past childbearing age. Quite possibly. Which brings you to three. Shem, Ham, and Japheth, from these three, the whole earth was populated. That means also from their three wives. That's right. So there's three. There's a possibility that Noah's wife had a daughter after the flood. The Bible doesn't say it, 
Yeah. Doesn't say necessarily no, but if there's a possibility, I put that in parentheses just in case there might be four main mitochondrial lines in the world. How many X chromosomes? That depends on, on a lot of random chance. There's a probability, it's like 25% chance that Noah's wife passed the same X chromosome to all three of her sons, in which case her other one's lost. That would give us seven in the current world population. If Noah had a daughter after the flood, he could have passed his X chromosome on that gives us nine. More than likely there are eight. But what this does is it shows us, according to the Bible, we would predict a lot of diversity amongst X chromosomes in the world. A little bit amongst the mitochondria and none, except for mutations that have occurred since the flood, none in the Y chromosome. Can that be true? The answer to all that is, oh, absolutely. It turns out, if you sample men from all over the world, we actually, just like many women claim, we are all the same. <laughs> That's right. We have the same Y chromosome, one, pointing back to a recent common ancestor. Um, in, in May of 2010, they finally published the chimpanzee Y chromosome. And they were shocked because it's only 70% identical to the human Y chromosome. You know, many people think that, oh, chimpanzees are 98% identical to humans in their genes. The Y chromosome is only 70%. The authors of that paper said that's how much difference they expected between man and chicken. And chicken's not even a mammal. Yes. And if that's true, in the evolutionary model now, they've got humans and chimpanzees being the same species six million years ago. And now we have radical differences in our Y chromosomes, and yet all the human males have a very similar Y chromosome. How can they explain rapid evolution of Y chromosome, and yet all people today have something very similar? It's a puzzle for them. I like to have that puzzle. Let them answer it. According to what we also find out about mitochondrial DNA, there are three main lineages found across the world. Wow. Now, the evolutionist doesn't think those are the ancestral images, lineages, but there's something else farther back. But that all depends upon mutation rates and things like that. But there are three that are found on every continent. All right. Now, Dr. Carter, we have to take a break. Okay. And we'll be right back. And when we come back, we're going to talk about the Tower of Babel. This is the place where God, because uh, men were uh, uh, aspiring to build this tower to reach to heaven, uh, he uh, scattered them and gave them different languages. And that also has genetic implications, doesn't Absolutely. it? And we'll talk about that when we come back. Don't you go away. This is fascinating. You don't want to miss any of it. Today's guest on Origins, Dr. Robert Carter, has a PhD in marine biology with a focus in genetics. He is currently one of the senior scientists and a speaker for Creation Ministries International USA. Dr. Carter believes that the human genome is an excellent confirmation of biblical history. He continues his groundbreaking genetics research and you can find many of his published articles at creation.com. To contact Dr. Carter, write to Creation Ministries International USA, Box 350, Powder Springs, Georgia, 30127 or call 800-616-1264. We are back with Dr. Robert Carter, who is a geneticist, and we've been talking about the things that he's learned from studying genetics, and do they square with God's Word? We looked at two big events in Genesis, at creation and the flood, and we found an amazing consistency between the biblical record and, and the genetic record. And there's one big event we want to look at still to, in this show, Dr. Carter, and that is the Tower of Babel. Tower of Babel story is found in Genesis chapter 11. It says very simply, the whole earth had one language and one speech. And right after that it says, and they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose tops in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. It's a very simple statement, but what this tells me is that there was one culture one people, and they're on purpose trying to stay together, which means I would expect them to intermarry and mix. And that's very important to consider in for just a second. Come, let us go down and confuse their language that they might not utter, understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them ab abroad from there over the face of the earth, and they ceased building the city. Essentially, God took the world and filled it up with people when he said this. And from Babel, from the Middle East, 
people dispersed across the world. Now, interestingly, there's abundant evidence for this in genetics. The evolutionists might call that the out-of-Africa event. But we have a lot of evidence for a single dispersal of people across the face of the planet some, from a location very close to the Middle East. The, the evolutionist doesn't argue that there was a dispersion from that single point. The most common not thing that you hear today is out, out of Africa. Africa, which is very similar to, the, to the, the biblical pattern. All right. If we have the Tower of Babel and the earth is full of people, now, the number of people alive at Babel, we're not necessarily certain, but it should have been in the thousands, given population growth and when Babel happened according to Scripture. Well, if God takes these people and randomly takes them and sends them in different directions, that means that each group is pretty much going to have a good selection of the number of genes available in the Babel population. So, based on that, we wouldn't expect to find much genetic difference between the people groups in the world or the races in the world. We'd expect a lot of commonality. And in fact, that's what we find. We find that, that people groups across the world are 99% or more identical to one another. And there's just a few things that separate us. Most of those are mutations that have occurred since Babel, since the dispersion. But then Genesis chapter 10 says something really interesting. It says, these were the families of the sons of Noah, according to, the, to their generations, in their nations. And from these, the nations were divided on earth after the flood. Well, this isn't a thing called the table of nations. It's just a list of all the sons of Noah and their sons and a few of their sons and where they went in the world. What this is saying is that God divided the world, not according to language, but that he used language to divide the world according to Y chromosome. And he took the clans, which are paternal, based on Y chromosome and sent each one in a different direction. And it, it goes back to the three sons of Noah. It goes back to the three sons of Noah. Well, this is actually the key to understanding modern genetics. Okay. Because modern genetics has raised a couple of puzzles, but they're explained by the Genesis account. For instance, we've already discussed how there's very little variation amongst Y chromosomes. But it turns out that the variations that we do find are very specific to geography. Like there are Irish Y chromosomes, African Y chromosomes, Chinese Y chromosomes, Pacific Islander Y chromosomes. These are very similar Y chromosomes, but since the people have gotten to where they are, mutations have occurred, mistakes in the spelling of, of, the, of the books of the genome, and each one is stuck in a specific location. But the mitochondrial DNA because God, God sorted the world according to Y chromosome and not the female line, the mitochondrial DNA all spread out. And that's why we find all three of the mitochondrial lines on all three of the continents. This is an incredible prediction. That's amazing. It, Absolutely it is amazing. fascinating. And after all that, after all those three big topics, I'm forced to conclude that modern genetics has essentially rediscovered Genesis. Just the big picture of Genesis, and that's all you can expect because it was thousands of years ago. We can't get exactly all the nitty-gritty details. But from a 10,000-foot view, when we look down at the data, we say, man, there's a lot of data that supports the biblical account, including the creation, the flood, and the Tower of Babel. Now, as a scientist, I'm really skeptical. I don't believe science can actually prove much of anything. I believe we can disprove things. And I don't find any obvious disproof for Genesis in modern genetics, and a lot of information does support it. Well, so if we said creation's true, the flood's true, and the Tower of Babel's true, what would we expect genetically to line up with that? It all lines up. Yes. Okay, that's amazing. God knew about genetics long before we did. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, his word proves true, and that blesses my heart so much. And you know, my friend, I want to say to you that if you've just viewed the Bible as some old book that's irrelevant, you need to take a second look at God's word and see the consistency of God's word with science. And I think that in the end at your, of your study, you'll come to the conclusion I have, that it's God's view he created you. And that should be your world view too. I hope to see you again here soon on Origins. Until then, God bless you, my friend.
Thank you for watching this edition of Origins. To get a copy of the information presented today, you can download a PDF file of program number 1110 from our website at www.originstv.org. Or for a DVD of this series, send a $12 donation to cover shipping and handling and write to Origins, program number 1110, Cornerstone Television, Wall, Pennsylvania, 15148. Origins is made possible by the faithful prayers and the financial support of you, our Cornerstone Television family.